Greetings, greetings, brethren, beloved. Welcome to another Bible study. It is indeed a pleasure to have all of us tuning in uh, to Bible study. Always good to have us. And of course, it is something that we must all endeavor to be a part of. All of us learn from the things that are being taught, that are being presented, and uh, it is all with the view to establish us, to cause us to matriculate and to grow in maturity. And so it is always important for us to be in Bible study. You just might not know what it is that you will miss out on. Sometimes uh, it is just a simple thing, and yet the impact can be so profound in the life of a child of God. So I want us to encourage our brothers and our sisters. I want us to encourage our friends, brethren. There are some brethren that just don't take the time out. You know, they're always in church on a Sunday and they'll rejoice and glorify God. And yet, the thing that will help to build us and to mold us and to cause us to grow and mature, which is sitting down and going through the word of God. Uh, many, unfortunately, are absent from that, and that certainly will impede our growth and development as children of God. So I encourage us, and I encourage us to get to other brethren that we know, so that together we are learning and forging ahead and getting to the place where God wants us to be so that he can use us in the way that he wants to use us. Now, we continue to look at some simple things in scriptures that has deep and profound lessons that we can pull from, that we can extract from. It is important that we recognize that God can use the big thing or the small thing. And if we know how our God is, and based on how the scripture describe him, we will realize that sometimes God chooses to use the base things to confound the wise. The simple things to confound those who believe that they are all that and they have it all. And there is just a way that God works with men. So he would use a David to slay a massive Goliath. Yes, it is the way that God chose to work. Of course, he could have raised up another that was as big as Goliath to kill Goliath. But he used a non-imposing figure. He used a small lad, someone in his teenage years, to take down a warrior, a fighter from the Philistines. And God somehow has that way of doing things. Not that we can predict how he will work, but he has the tendency to do the things that we least expect. And so we have been for the last couple of weeks, of course we had a break in between, but we have been going through examining or examining sorry, how God uses simple things to bring out lessons that we might think we wouldn't be able to learn from the simple creatures or the simple things around us that we see from day to day and we would normally take for granted. We were the last time in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30, and I believe we were at verses 18 and 19, where the writer, Arger, as he was known, had outlined four things that he said was amazing to him. And there were some lessons, the fact that they were placed right there in the Bible, we quite clearly understand that they were placed there so that we could be admonished from the lessons that we would have learned from the things that were written there. And so it is important that we first of all understand that even though 
the smallest, the most insignificant in the kingdom of God is greater than John the Baptist, who himself, the Bible says, was the greatest of all the prophets. We were in this era, the most insignificant of us. We are greater than the greatest prophet who was John the Baptist. Even though that is the case, I want us to understand that we can learn from the weakest of creature. We can learn from the smallest of creature. And so the scripture that we had examined the last time in Proverbs 30 verses 18 and 19, it spoke about the way of an eagle in the air. It spoke about the way of a serpent on a rock, the way of a ship in the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. And these four things seem so insignificant, and yet they were replete with nuggets that we can extract and apply to our lives to enhance the quality of our Christian walk. And I want to uh, make it clear to all of us as Christians, the Bible is one book, many different books put together to make one complete whole. And I want us to understand that we can learn and we can benefit and we can grow and we must grow from all the things that are contained in the book. One author, many writers, one book called the Bible. And we learn from the Psalms, we learn from the Proverbs, we learn from the prophets, we learn from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We learn from the Acts, we learn from the Epistles, we learn from the book of Revelation, which is prophetic in nature. We learn and we grow from our understanding and our appreciation of the things that are contained in the whole book. And so we would have learned some things from these four things that I just mentioned, these four components that I just made reference to, the eagle in the ear, the serpent on a rock, yes, the ship in the sea, and a man with a young maid, young virgin, a young lady. And all of these things has lessons for us to learn, to help us in our walk with God. Never believe that you are too big. I must never believe that I am too big to learn a lesson from what seem to be insignificant events, insignificant things, insignificant creatures in the Bible. And wisdom is very important. And the Bible tells us that wisdom must be sought after. It is more important than gold. It is more important than strength, wisdom. So we are going to learn wisdom from some of the most unlikely mammals or animals, whatever we want to call them. We are going to learn wisdom. And so we are still in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom. Solomon wrote most of the book, but there were one or two other writers that might have chipped in with a chapter or so here or there. But it is a book of wisdom. It is, and if we recall the history of Solomon, God specifically gave him wisdom to the extent that he was the awe and wonder of so many folks around the world. They looked to Jerusalem, they looked to Israel, they were awestruck at how wise the kind of proverbs, the kind of songs, the kind of sayings, the, just the wisdom of the man. And folks would come from far and near to hear of his wisdom. And so it is important that we extract from the book of Proverbs some of the wisdom, some of the gems that are there that will help us in our walk in this 21st century, in uh, this present day, in our Christian experience. It is important. And so there is a scripture, and I use this scripture because it kind of shows to us how God operates many times. I mean, he doesn't have to do it because he can choose to pull a king and use a king 
to bring about his will and to execute his plan. But if we look at how God works, he many times use simple things and foolish things and small things to tear down big things and to uh, upset and cause to be in bewilderment those that claim to be wise, those that are the high and the mighty, and those that are at the top of this uh, status quo in terms of society. I want us to understand that God has a way. So he gave us this word in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm in the, the, the Bible here at about verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the and the things that are speak to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. And, and verse 29 now says that no flesh should glory in his presence. So I want us to understand, beloved, that many times God in his own wisdom, for his own reason, use simple things. And therefore, we must not despise the day of small things. Don't, don't look at something and say, this is too simple. Pass that over to this young child, this young convert over there. All of us can learn from simple things. And God has somehow made it his point of duty. As we look through the book of Proverbs at different parts. You, earlier on, we were in, as I said, we were in uh, chapter 30 of Proverbs, verses 18 and 19. And we saw some simple things. God used those to bring out points. And then now tonight, we are going to be spending some time in verses 24 to 28 to look at some creatures, simple creatures, seemingly weak and insignificant but yet it is in scripture and we were admonished and pushed by the wisest man Solomon in in the book of Psalm Proverbs sorry chapter number 30 number 6 verses 6 and 7 if I might just quickly glance at it so that we can Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 6, I just want us to look at it just for a brief moment. I think it's going to be brought up on the screen because I want us to see, beloved, that as simple as some things are, we are directed, we are pushed to look at them. And here it is in Proverbs 6, verses 6, 7, and probably 8. Solomon is instructing us Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. That is us being admonished and being upbraided to go and look at the ants. What verse 7 says, and consider her ways and get wisdom. So what is being said is that as people that are serving the God of gods, we can gain wisdom by looking at, in this particular instance, the ants, the ant, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. Solomon pushes, instructs, admonishes, advise individuals, look to the ant and get wisdom. So an ins insignificant thing as the ant can provide us, beloved, with wisdom that all of us will need so that we can advance our walk, advance our Christianity, advance 
our searching and seeking and walking and living for God. And we can do it with wisdom. And wisdom is what is going to lead us ultimately to that place where all of us intend to be. So having said that, we are going to now go over to examine for Bible study tonight a simple subject matter, a simple subject area. Big lessons from little things. That's the subject matter that we are going to delve in to tonight. And it is important that we take the time out, all of us, and follow through and delve in with us. We, 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 we will take our time. And at the same time, we will be moving at a certain speed. Um, but it is important that we see what is being said and that we extract the things and apply the things so that we can and we will advance with wisdom. And that is so very important. So many, because the opposite of being wise is being foolish. And I want us to understand that we don't want to have any foolish Christians in the 21st century, in this time and era that we are living in, especially in the days that we are in. We want all of us to understand that we can advance and we can move with wisdom. I want all of us to understand that we can make it and we will only make it through these turbulent times if we are as harmless as a dove and we are as wise as serpents. How could God use such a thing in the Bible? The serpent which was so deceptive and yet we learned from the same Bible study that we have been doing that even from the serpent we were admonished to learn something from him. Jesus said, be harmless as a dove, but yet be wise as a serpent. And there was a lesson there. So we're not going over that because we went through that already. The point is we can learn from things that we might think has no capacity or ability to teach us. But we better be careful. We better be humble. We need to be open. And we need to follow the instruction of Solomon. In Proverbs 6 and verse 6. Go to the ant and learn wisdom. So how are we going to learn wisdom from the ants or whatever else? We will look at what they do. We will see how they do it. We will present the lessons there. Extract them. And we will apply them. And I absolutely guarantee you, I absolutely guarantee us that when that is done, we will find ourselves moving at a pace, moving to a point where when we look back, we say, oh my God, how did I reach here? Here, It is important that we understand. Get the lessons, learn the lessons, apply the lessons, and live. And watch and see how we become wise and how we become champions and giants in the house of our Lord. So let's turn to the slides at this time. And we are going to, as I said before, go into the subject area of big lessons from little things. And it's important. I want us to catch that now. The, the, there is an old saying, many times we would have heard it and it is important that we understand the principle of what was being said. There's this saying from way back and even my mother, my grandmother mentioned it many, many times years ago. They said, never judge a book by its cover. Never judge a book by its cover. And what they were saying is that don't judge something before you get the chance to examine it in its entirety. In other, sometimes the way how it is presented, the cover, what meets your eyes at the first, um, would cause you to put it aside. And so the cover is not appealing. 
what catches your eyes at first is not appealing. And the, the natural, normal tendency is to put that aside so that you can look again to find something that is more catchy, that is more appealing. See, and, and, and that being the case, you are going to instinctively gravitate to getting that book which is catchier, flashier, the, the, the title is just so awesome that it pulls you to it. And yet, there might be a book seemingly so simple, cover not as catchy as some of the others, but then the content, what is contained inside of that volume is so rich and deep that you would have missed out tremendously had you passed it over. And so the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover, F practically, physically, it goes beyond that. You know, don't judge a man by how he walks. Don't judge a lady by how this, that, and that. You can apply it to anything. But the bottom line is, don't think that something cannot be of use or value to you simply because of your initial perception of the particular person or thing. And it is important that we understand that concept as we move into what we are drilling into. And that being the case, it takes us back again to the scripture that I quoted earlier on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27. God can use simple things, and he has, to confound the things that are mighty and the people that are wise or in their own minds or in the minds of the society, they are the wisdom of this world. And God can confound them with simple things. And it's important that we understand that. So having said that, having said that, I want us now to move into the lessons. And you might think that an ants or a coney or the locusts or a spider. What can I learn from those little pesky insects or animals. What can I learn? Don't judge a book by its cover. Yes? And God can use insignificant things, small things, to teach us lessons, the impact of which are huge, big, and impacting. And it's important that we appreciate that. Now, Proverbs chapter 30 Verses 24 to 28. Let's, let's bring it up on the screen and read it. And then we come back and we go through the slide. At least let us start with the scriptures so that you see where I am. And we see exactly what the scriptures are saying. And we come right back and we go through and delve into the study. There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The cornies are but a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet Go they forth, all of them, by bands. The spider take it hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Beloved, those are powerful scriptures. This script that we have just looked at teach us about four weak things. None of us can look at any one of these creatures and consider them to be mighty. None of them are like lions or elephants. Lions are the kings, are the king of the beasts. And God did not name them amongst these to teach us a lesson. Yet in other parts of the Proverbs, and we will look at that later on. So we are taking our time to go through, you know, to look at how God uses things. And in many instances, small things, but then he can use the big things too. But we are on the small things. And none of us would ever leave with the concept that an ant or a cone or 
locusts or spiders, any of these are great creatures. None of these that we are looking at here now are big or great, have anything about them that would cause us to be in awe and would cause us to run in fear or anything like that in a general sense. They are small creatures and they are not impacting they by themselves, don't provide any major impact. You wouldn't think about a, an ant as you would think about a lion. You wouldn't think about a coney in the same way as you would think about an elephant. You wouldn't think about a locust or locusts or spiders in the same way that you'll think about a, a, a giraffe or a rhinoceros that would cause you to hide in fear or to say this is a great creature and you stand in oh no 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 you see an ant or uh, some ants walking along you throw or spray them with big on or you stamp them or you sit them on the deck and you use your finger and kill them. Yes, that's what we see a locust outside, we take a, a shoe and we slap it, slap it to death and kill it. We look in the roof and we see spiders. What we do with these things is take mops and wipe them down. So these creatures are so insignificant, so small, that we would easily have glossed over them, passed over them and moved on to do what it is that we were doing, not realizing that as little as they are, as small as they are, these little creatures have lessons in them that the wisest man Solomon gave instructions to go to the ants and to learn from them and to in so doing, as we learn, develop wisdom. So what is it about these creatures that we can learn that can impact us in a powerful way, that can impact us to the point where we have a teaching moment that can build us and, and cause us to grow from strength to strength. What it is about them? Before we go into each of these areas, I just want to, want to share some pointers with us. I want us to understand the principle of treating with small things, the principle of treating with insignificant things, weak things, so that we can see that even with weak things, there can be powerful great large results that can redound to our advancement as we walk with God or just generally in life. Sometimes it is some simple life lessons that gives us a great insight that somehow unfolds, illuminates our mind to the extent that we move on to do greater things. Simple things, simple life lessons can cause major illumination that helps us along the way in whatever uh, space that we are in at the time. But we are focusing tonight on our walk with God because ultimately, and in essence, that is what this is all about. And I want us to understand that. So we are on to the slides now. And the first point that we are looking at, I want us to understand, beloved, that each illustration, the ant, the coney, the spider, and the locust, each of the illustrations, we will find that they contain a lesson so that it causes us to understand more clearer what it is that they are portraying and so gives us wisdom as we apply the things that they represent. Every one of them, as simple as these creatures are, they illustrate something very important. And I want us to understand that. Forget about those that are afraid of ladies, especially afraid of if you see a grasshopper or a locust, whatever, you run away. Yes, that might be so. But I want us to understand if you see a spider over there, you scream and you run. We understand that. But pull back a little while. Don't look up in the roof as we go through this lesson. I want you to be focused on the screen. I want you to be focused on what is being said because there is a lesson from the spider that I, that you can learn and can apply and can, that can push us on our walk with God. Now, each of the creatures portray a different aspect of wisdom in action. And we will show that as we go through that in their particular weakness, they are able to still survive 
You realize that no matter how you spray your house and you do all that you do, before long, you look up in the ceiling when a visitor come and a lady feel embarrassed because here in our house that you just clean and spray out and it smell nice and look clean right up in the corner there, you see a spider's web with a little spider running out and peeping at you. It happens so very often and I want us to understand, yes, that in that, there is a lesson. So yes, indeed, there, there are different aspects of uh, wisdom that we can pull from each of the creatures that we are going to look at. Then the lessons to be learned from the wisdom of these four creatures, and this is, the, this is the big point that I want us to hold on to. This is the point that I know and that I, I believe once we, we, we grasp the thing, we will learn many things. But there's one significant point that is important that we learn. And it's, it's this. The wisdom of these four creatures is simply this. And this is the definition. Wisdom is defined by the ability to recognize, and I'm talking about wisdom as we would have extracted it from the four creatures that we are looking at, that we have to study and to pull from today. Wisdom is defined by the ability to recognize one's problems and limitations and then set about to compensate for them. In other words, each of these creatures recognize that they are small, they have their weakness, they are insignificant in the scheme of things, and yet none of them are extinct creatures. Today in the 21st century, as it was thousands of years ago, when even this was being written, Ants were still around. At the time that that was written, there was ants. That's why he wrote about the ants. The locusts were there. That's why he could write about them. He knew about them. Hmm? The spiders were there. He wrote about them. And the conies were there. All there, almost 2,000 years, over 2,000 years now. Over 2,000 years now. They were all there. 2,000 years later, they're still here. What is that saying to us? In spite of their weaknesses, in spite of their seeming insignificance in relation to all the other big creatures that were around, guess what? They are still here. They had developed the capacity. They recognized their own weakness dealt with the weakness, make the necessary adjustments, many times instinctively, because, you know, they are God's creature like how you and I are. And therefore, even us, when we recognize our own weaknesses, will be able, under God, because we are his creation, to make the necessary adjustments to compensate for where we are short and make up so that we can not only be here today, but to be around tomorrow and still be walking with God 50 years from now if our lives are spared. All these creatures 2,000 years later are still around. It speaks to their ability in spite of their weaknesses to go through and make it and survive. And they are still here. So wisdom from this lesson, what we learn, the wisdom of these four creatures, is that the ability to recognize their problems and limitations and then set about to make the necessary adjustment to compensate for their weakness so that they can continue to survive is a lesson for all of us to learn. Do you know that dinosaurs have died out? Do we understand today that there are some species in the animal kingdom that have since passed on? They died out of the system. They were unable to make it through to the 21st century. They became extinct. And yet, 
as big as they were. Look at their counterparts, the ant, the little locust, the spider up there, and the cone who is so weak in his feet. And they are still around, even though the dinosaurs and some of the other big creatures have all gone. Understand, even in our weakness, we can ad make adjustments and work around our weakness and maintain our walk and our longevity and our living with Almighty God. And we will see it as we go through um, these, um, the lesson here this evening. Now, and we just, that point that is there, and the bullet, we just, we just cover that. And these creatures will all illustrate the great way in which the disadvantages of weakness may be overcome by a particular quality. Brethren, I want us to understand that there are none of us that can boast that we have no weakness. I personally believe that all of us have a weakness somewhere. Some of us more than one weakness says. Weakness does not mean failure because as a human being, as an individual, as a man or a woman, we are going to always, until Jesus comes, we are going to always be confronted with some things. We are going to always have fightings and we are going to always have things that we are struggling with. Yes, I want us to understand that. But I also want us to understand that weakness does not mean defeat. Weakness does not mean extinction. Weakness being a part of us. And if we are wise like the ant and the others and recognize those weaknesses, we can make the necessary adjustments. And I believe that is what God is teaching us. They are small, they are insignificant, they are weak. But they are still around. They are still standing. Why? They did some things that caused them to be able to weather the storm and to live through the wilderness and the jungle that they are a part of. And while others are no longer around, these four are still there. There's wisdom that we can learn from the ant. And I want us to learn these things. And so... All that we are saying, all that we are saying, in all that we have presented so far, is that whatever it is, wherever we are, however insignificant we think we are, I want us to understand, I want us to appreciate, I want us to know that we can overcome, we can make it. We can be the best. 50 years from now, we can still be standing in the house of the Lord if the Lord tarries and if he spares our lives. And if the rapture comes, we will be assured that we are going to make it in the rapture. It, we, it is important that we understand how we live and how we govern our lives. The lessons we learn and how we apply it is important to our longevity as children of God. And it is absolutely an important imperative that we take into consideration the simple things, the simple lessons that these creatures have to offer. And so we take our time and we move, yes, and, and, and as we said earlier on, the weak things God used to confound the mighty. Don't lose sight of that. The small things can teach us big lessons. And having said that, and having looked at Corinthians, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 1 and verse 27, which we read earlier so we don't have to read it again, the essence of it is the weak things of the world God uses to confound the things that are mighty. Understand that whatever big obstacle might be in your way as a child of God, God has an answer. God has something 
even from a small creature, even in an insignificant situation, God has something that you can use to learn from, that you can pull from, that will allow you, that will allow me to step over, to master the obstacle that is in our way. And that is important, that is significant, that is something that we must embrace and understand. I don't care who you are, it don't matter where you are on the totem pole right now, it is important that you know that you can learn from small things and get the big lessons that they are teaching and move up, move higher and higher and higher. And when the role is called up yonder, you will be assured, you can be assured that you will be there. If the role is not called for the next hundred years and God gives you good health and you live a hundred years from now, you can be assured that if you appreciate and apply, put in action these principles a hundred years from now, if the Lord tarries, you will still be standing as a child of God because of the powerful lessons that you would have learned from simple, simple lessons, you know, but profound, powerful, deep, impacting, and you will make it in your walk with God. So, like I said, God uses simple things. He uses simple people. He also uses illustrations from nature. And that is what we are going to pull from today. The illustrations from nature to teach us some principles that will cause us to walk good and to make it as children of Almighty God. So the first lesson that we are going to look at, lesson number one, speaks to the ants. Yes? And... Solomon actually taught us, and we had said that already, and we, we, we read it for you earlier on. Go to the ants, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise. Wisdom will come when we learn from these insignificant creatures. Consider her ways and be wise. And so, what we want to present to us, and we can go to the slide, what we want to present to us at this time is that the ant, notice at the heading, we had beside the ant that it is industrious. That is something key about the ant. I want us to understand that this little creature, this little creature, the ant, is a very industrious creature. It doesn't matter how far they have to walk. If you notice the ant, they go far, far away from their little mold hills where they live in search of food. And you watch those ants going around. Them, the distances that they go is unbelievable. But then they go to where they have to go and then they find their food. And after a while, you see three ants. If you leave a biscuit crumb, it doesn't matter how far upstairs you leave it. Before long, ants are going to find it. And they might be coming from way over somewhere yonder, but they are going to find it. They have that ability to smell or discern or whatever it is, but they are going to find it. Now, if you drop a cracker, a whole a cracker, half a cracker, whatever. Drop some biscuit, drop a piece, slice a piece of bun in the corner. Those ants, they are going to find it. Now, what you're going to find happening with the ants is that they are going to come. They are so hardworking. It doesn't matter the size of the thing that is there. They are going to take their time and they are going to work out how do we pull this thing apart. And so before you know it, even if there's a, 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 a roach that is dead in there. So we could either use a biscuit, a piece of bun, or a roach. Let us use a roach. That one is harder to swallow. They cover, they surround that roach. And before you know it, they find that sometimes they can't move it. So you know what those ants do? They, they, they pull it apart. So you see a set of them going off with one leg. And then before you know it, they are able to pull off the other leg so they can carry one big 
roach. So them just tear off the leg bit by bit. And then you look again and you see another set going away with a wing. And sometimes you might just see one ant. If it's the breadcrumbs or the bun and the crumbs, you see them moving off with the crumbs. So you see a crumb moving. Sometimes you don't even see the ant. You don't see a big piece of crumb moving. And one ant, I want us to understand this. One ant has the ability to carry 5,000 times its body weight. Yeah. So as insignificant as you see that little creature, the ant, that ant has the ability to carry 5,000 times its body weight. So it, it, it carries a bigger punch than how he really looks. I want us to appreciate and to understand, brethren, beloved, a single one of us, as I said earlier on, we might see ourselves as insignificant and can't do anything. I want us to get rid of that thought pattern. I want us to banish that from our minds, from our consciousness. We are not ordinary. We are peculiar people. We have been made that way. And I want us to understand that although we are individuals, we can do much more than we are doing or we think we can do. The Bible puts it this way. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have the ability, we have the capacity to carry not just 5,000 times our spiritual weight, so to speak, but much more than that. We have the ability to move mountain, to say this mountain, mountain, get out of my way because of the faith that God has given us. I believe that too many of us children of God. We are underestimating who we are. We are underestimating what God has given us. We are underestimating the potential that we have and things that we are supposed to be doing and accomplishing for God. Mountains that we are supposed to be moving just like how these ants move big things and carry them away to where they want it to be. We have the capacity and the potential to do these things. However, we are not learned as we are supposed to be. Learn from the ants. The ants is industrious, always hardworking. I want us to know that in the kingdom of God, there is no place and space for lazy people. We have to take from the ants and learn from the ants and understand that they are a hardworking set. Though small, we can observe them lifting large loads and carrying them back. And let me tell you, they do this in preparation for difficult times. I want us to understand that these ants, they know exactly what they're doing. If any obstacle is in their way, I want us to know that they have this uncanny ability. They are determined to get the job done. That they are going to go around, either to the right, around to the left if they can't go around and they find that they are going to find a way and go over that obstacle and look here they are pulling that roach leg with them over the obstacle in the way they are taking with them the head and all and and and, and after a while you see a set of them if they if one of them alone can't carry everything you see a set of them and they make a formation and they carry that other insect over the obstacle that is in their way but they have a plan they know that at a certain time they are going to need that for food and so how the bible says it is that in the summer they go to where they must go and they gather what they must gather and they work at it and then they carry it to the place of storage in preparation for the winter they know that there is going to come a time when they can't do some things so in the time when they can do it, they make the best of the opportunity and they do it to the best of their ability and make preparation for the winter that is coming at which time they are unable to do it. That's a lesson in itself. I want us to understand that as children of God, we will have it like this all the time. As we age, I want us to understand our winter days are coming. As we age, we are not going to be as sharp 
as we used to be. As we age, we are not going to walk as strong as we used to walk. As our winter years come, as our twilight years come, we are not going to do the things that we really would want to do for God because the mind might be willing, but physically the body is going to be weak. The body is not going to be able to do it. So we can learn from the ant that while we are young we, and have our youth, honor the creator. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth when the evil days come not. I want the saints to understand that we must be wise like the ant. And while we are able to work hard, be industrious, get the things together that we must have in place, because believe it or not, and you better understand when I say believe it or not, because some people believe it's not going to happen. But you're going to get old. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. The rapture is going to come. It's not going to be like this at all times. And the wise ants, they in the summertime, they work and they do what they have to do and they carry what they have to carry and they carry it back to that, their storehouse and they keep it there because the winter time is coming when they are going to be unable to go out. When the time gets cold, you can drop things all over. You're not going to see ants running out. You, you, the, you're going to say, oh my God, they're all gone, but they, they can't function at that time. But they're not going to die of starvation. They're not going to die of lack because they prepared, they made preparation. They made hay while the sun was shining. And that is an important concept and principle that we must pull from the ants. They are industrious. They work hard. They put things together in the time when they have the strength and the energy and the might. They work in the summertime according to Solomon's writing in Proverbs 6 and verse 6. And they, in the summer, they put it together and store it away for the winter time when they are unable to work. And they will have food and sustenance and they will therefore survive to another day, to another decade, to another century. We're still seeing ants today after Solomon wrote that thing because of their wisdom, their industry, their hardworking uh, ability to work hard. And notice, they are not distracted. If, as I said before, if obstacles come in their way, they are going to find a way and get around it. So they are hardworking and they, you can't distract them. And if anything comes in the way that will distract them, they are going to find a way around it and they maintain their focus. This is the ants. This is what we must be aware of. This is what we must always understand. They are a people that prepare. So they do the work in the summer, store, collect their food, march with it, and they head right down to the camp, and they put it there, and they prepare for the winter. This tells us something further. I want us to understand that there's something about the ants that we must never lose sight of. They are always looking ahead. Not physically now, but in their planning. They're always looking ahead. Notice that what you see they're doing, when you see them in their numbers, usually in the heat, the summertime, they're busy working, and they're always carrying things. They're looking ahead. They know instinctively that winter is coming. They know instinctively that they have to do this now. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the time that we must witness. Now is the time that we must tell people about God. Now is the time that we must worship him with all of our heart and our soul and our might. Now is the time that we must get into the different ministries and work while it is there. Now is the time because we are supposed to be able to have a vision. We are supposed to be able to look ahead and know that in doing this now, we are going to reap the harvest later. We must have foresight. We must be able to look ahead and know what is going to happen if we do this thing now. That is how the ants work. And so they do all of this now. 
because they can see ahead and know that winter is coming and they can't operate in the cold. They can't find food in the cold. They can't do something. So they know what is coming and they look ahead. Work now in preparation for what is to come. That speaks directly to us as people of God. That speaks to us directly as individuals. We must be able to look ahead and based on what we know is coming, do the work now so that we can reap the harvest and we can be ready for the time when we are unable to physically do the work. It is a message straight from the wisdom of the ants to work while it is today, to work hard, to not be distracted, to, to, to have foresight, to look ahead, and to put things in place. If we don't do that, I guarantee us that we would be at the end of the foolish man. Our end will be like that of the foolish man. Yes? I'm talking to your wisdom. I'm explaining to us illustrations from the ants. They're teaching us a lesson. Solomon said, learn and be wise. And they work hard, not distracted, look ahead, plan. And, and make preparation for the time when they are unable to work. That is powerful. That is wisdom for all of us. So I, I, I summed it all up and have it there as a point. What do we get from the ants? Those four things are summed up, right? They're hardworking, uh, they're not distracted, the ability to look ahead, and therefore plan ahead, and then the ability to work now, knowing that the day is coming when they are going to be unable to work. When we put all this together, we see the wisdom of preparation and foresight. And I want us to know that that is a powerful lesson from the ant for every single child of God. Planning ahead to meet contingencies. It don't matter who you are. I don't care who you are. This is for all of us. Whatever your position, whatever your, 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 your place in life at this time, whatever your stand, your position in the house of God, whatever ministry you're in, whatever position you hold, this is a, 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 a lesson for life from the ants. Wisdom of preparation and foresight. And the things that I just went through easily comes out when we look at the ants and we see exactly who they are and how they do their thing and that is powerful and that is important grasp it embrace it action it and you will see how it allows for for all of us to be on the upper hand later on in life now the next slide which is lesson number two is a, a animal, a mammal, a creature that uh, many of us, we see them, and it's as if it's a scaredy cat. The coney, it stands on its hind legs and looks around, and if it senses danger, it runs away and runs to his home. But there's something about the coney that we just have to take time and learn from. There's something about this little creature. He knows, she knows that her hind leg, which is supposed to be the more powerful of the four that she has or he has, is a stronger. And yet, instinctively, the creature knows that that is no match for the predator that is going to come by. The coney knows. And the coney knows that he lives in an environment where if you are not sharp and careful, you are either breakfast, lunch, or dinner for some other 
animals that are around. The coney knows that. So it is aware of its small and insignificant size. And the coney somehow the instinctively know that is no match. It's defenseless against the big, bigger animals that are there in the wild. But he also instinctively knows that he has to survive. And he's not going to be breakfast just like that or dinner just like that. You're gonna, if you're going to have me for dinner, you're going to have to work hard for this dinner. And you're not going to get it that easily. And today, as I said earlier, conies are still around. They have survived. They have not been extinct. Climatic conditions and other predators have not been able to cause the coney to become extinct, not even to today. They know how to survive. What is it about the coney, however, that would have caused them over these centuries, millennia, to still be around? So the coney is aware of its weakness. And as a result, instinctively knows that he has to position himself so that even though I am weak, I have something around me to protect me. I have something set in a way that the predators cannot reach to me. So you know what the Kony does? He has the ability, and I want us to understand this, beloved. All of us has something about us that makes us able with whatever weakness we have, it makes us able to organize and position or reposition ourselves so that even with the weakness, we can deal with the weakness and still walk and be strong and survive. The key is to understand that there is a weakness and the weakness has to be dealt with. And so we must know now that if we're going to deal with the weakness, do what is necessary so that the weakness does not hamstring us and cause us to become prey. Yes? So we have to first admit, know that we have a weakness. And the Kony is fully aware of his size, fully aware that he's weak in his knees. But he does not allow that weakness to say, boy, let's give up my dead. Come, only just come eat me. Not going to do that. What the Kony does, he seeks safety upon the hills where the rocks are. And he makes his house, he makes his hiding place, he makes his, the, the place of preserve for him up in the cliff of the rock. If you want me, come and get me. Now the lion, the tiger, the leopard, the, 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 whatever the predators are. They cannot climb those kind of mountains and go up into those rocks and find a place in the cleft of the rock to reach to the coney. They can't. They can't reach them there. The rock is a defense. So even though he's unable to fight like the lion or to fight like the tiger and defend himself, no, he has a defense. But his defense is in the cleft of the rock, I want us to understand that. You know, David had said it in Psalm 61 and verse 2. He knows that his hiding place is up in a rock. You know, these things teach us some things. And David himself and others know that if you want to find a place of safety, to find protection, to hide from the enemy, to hide from certain death, they know that they have to go up into a place where they can look down and where they can be covered and where the enemy can't easily reach it and where, where they can hide. They know. And so David said, from the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, when I am now at a place of vulnerability, when I am weak, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. David taught us to run to the rocks for safety. It is the same thing. The, 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 the Kony don't understand English or Spanish or French 
or any language, but he instinctively knows that he must go to the rock and hide in the cleft of the rock for his defense. And that is a very significant, significant feature of the Kone. He knows that he needs protection. He knows that he is defenseless, and his only defense is in the cleft of the rock. Can I tell us, beloved, that we as people of God, children of God, individual saints, sometimes with the kind of things that we are confronted with and the kind of weaknesses that we have, and nobody knows our weakness except us and God, and if we are going to have the mastery, we better acknowledge those weaknesses and then run to the rock of our salvation and hide in the cleft of the rock. And can I tell you, this rock for you and I is not the rock that the coney run up on the hillside and just run into those clefts and hide in the rock. But we have a rock even stronger than that. And that rock is Jesus Christ. The more we recognize and identify our weaknesses, the more we must run to the rock and hide ourselves in Jesus, hiding him for protection. Because you see that weakness that we have? The adversary, Satan, is going to come at us and use our weakness to pull us to the ground. That's his intention. That is his plan. That is what he's out to do because he knows. He, he, he goes, we know, God knows what our true weaknesses are, but I, I want to tell you, the adversary knows. And he watches us, and he sees us when we are at our most vulnerable. He sees us when we are in the quiet place where nobody else is, where nobody else is seeing. His minions are around, and they know what you do in secret, and they're going to use it against you. So with our weakness, we must identify them, confess them, present them to the Lord, and run and hide in the rock that is higher than I. Incidentally, the, the Kone, his name comes from a Hebrew word, I didn't put it there, but it, it, the, the meaning of his name, that Kone, his name really means hider. He hides. But he's not doing that because he's a coward. He's doing that because he's wise. He is aware of his weakness. He is aware of his disability or his inability. But he knows that he has to survive. And if he is going to survive, he knows that he cannot confront the lion, he cannot confront the rhinoceros, or any of the predators that are around in the wild, because he's aware of his shortcomings. He's aware of his weaknesses. He's aware of how vulnerable he is. And so instinctively, with the wisdom that he has, he knows that these creatures, these predators, cannot reach in these cliffs. And he makes his home there, and that becomes his defense. And so we see the lesson that we learn here, the necessity of protection, the necessity of security and the, the, the corny knows that and he ensures that he's always near once he goes and he gets his food he's not too far away from the rock he's always in close proximity he's always in a running distance from his home in the cleft of the rock i submit to the saint of god don't stand at any distance, don't go far from the rock of your salvation. Stay near. Hide. One writer puts it this way, hiding in the oh blessed rock of ages. I'm hiding in the, I want us to be wise like the Kone and learn to hide in the rock. And this rock is Jesus Christ. And it's very important that we learn that lesson and understand that concept from the corner, hide. There are some times when we have to draw back. So sometimes when we have to just 
run into the rock, into the cleft of the rock. Just run into and just stay there. I hear one songwriter put it this way. I am afraid of the storm. Hold me. Hold me. Somewhere down there in some other verse, it talks about hide me. I'm afraid of the storm. We need to understand and we need to make sure. Saints of God, wh whoever you are, make sure that you understand the need and the necessity for protection, for security. And it is only found in the rock of all ages. When you are there, like the coney, what the predators can't touch when he's in the cleft of the rock. You cannot be touched if you're hiding in the cleft of the rock. Which rock is Jesus Christ? You will be untouchable. Yes, you will be unmovable. Always abounding in the work, love of the Lord. So understand this concept and learn this lesson from the coney. Yes, so the answer is industrious and hardworking and not easily distracted. And then the coney is aware of his inability. And so he makes sure that his defense is not in his legs. And in his hands, the, the, the two front legs, which are weak, and he knows. But he ensures that his protection, his defense, his security is in the cleft of the rock. Like you and I must pull from that to ensure that our security, our protection, our defense is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the rock of our salvation. I want us to see the, the, the parallel, the principle, and understand the concept. These are things that Solomon said are wise. They are wisdom in action. They might look simple, but they are profound. They are deep. And we only want to put these things into action. How do we hide in Jesus? Pray more, fast more, get into the thing, and we will be surprised at the strength that we receive, even though we know of inherent weaknesses, but we are still in a position to make our way as children of God and to survive and survive and survive and continue to, to, to serve God, not just in survival mode, but in overflowing mode because we have hidden ourselves in the cleft of the rock and we understand that this rock is Jesus Christ. What a God. What a lesson from an insignificant creature as a coney. My God. So we move on to lesson number three. And so one, lesson one, the and, lesson two, the coney. Lesson three, the low cost. Very important. The low cost. And in bracket, you would have seen me put there team player and a dash or a slash disciplined. So there is something about the locusts, and there are some things about the locusts that we must look at and learn. Again, like the other two, there are lessons for us to extract and apply to our lives. They work together as a team. And there's something that we need to know about the locusts. The scientists and the researchers have done their thing, and they have found out that they, they have no leader. But they have this uncanny ability to work together, to follow a certain order. They have a discipline about them. They have a an understanding that if they are going to achieve something, they have to move as a team. They have to operate as a, a band of brothers or a band of sisters or a band of brothers and sisters together. They, they know instinctively that if they are going to swoop in to a particular city and do what they have to do. They know that they are going to have to do it together as a team. So that team spirit is important to 
the maintenance of the clan, the maintenance of the group, the maintenance of the whatever you call that swarm of locusts. If they are going to do anything, they know instinctively that they are going to have to do it together. And what the researchers have observed is that order and discipline is literally a part of what they do. Now, the, the researchers have shown, they have indicated to us that low costs, when they operate as a, that band, as that swarm, they have been known to take down great civilizations. You know how? They come in as a swarm. In fact, when the locusts are coming, they come in and the skies, all of a sudden, the place seems to get dark because they are so together. There are so many of them that the light from the sun that would normally come down to the land and come down to earth, they block the light so that all of a sudden it comes in like a cloud blocking the rays of the sun. And the locusts would come down in a swarm and the place gets dark. And when those locusts come down and hit the crop, you know, they go through like a massive, massive band of terrorists. And before you know it, the wheat harvest is gone. Before you know it, the corn harvest is gone. Before you know it, everything is gone. And you know what happened to the people in those regions? They die of starvation. So that the researchers have said these Swarms are known to bring down great civilization because they eat down the crops right down to the ground and they swarm in and then after a while you see the swarm just hop off back and they go back out. Like I said, they instinctively know something. They know the value, the power of teamwork, being united, working together, a common cause. This is the lesson. This is the message from the locusts, you know, brethren. Togetherness, working towards one end, working as a group. The locusts do it for a, a cause that brings destruction to humanity. But as people of God, do you know that we are supposed to be operating like the locusts? However, not for destruction, but for construction, not for tearing down, but for building up. And the wise man put the locust there, not because he wants us to tear down like how the locusts tear down. Otherwise, that wouldn't be godly. But he puts it there for us to see the lesson. What is the lesson? The lesson is what can happen when we work as a team. What can be accomplished when we are united? What can be accomplished when we are orderly and when we are disciplined? A an entire civilization was brought to its knees by locusts. An entire generation can be saved when we operate as a team and when we operate together and when we are united and decide that we are going to go out there and get the thing done. Just like the locusts, we can take a city. Not for its destruction, but for its upliftment. We, you know, I was in, I was in um, street service on Sunday night. And I, uh, while street service was going on, you know, I was observing some things. And I said, but you know, we could have had 10 persons there that night, which a few nights ago, we could have had five to 10 people there and the service would have gone on. But I submit that the impact could have been different. Not because of the lack in terms of power of the Holy Ghost, no. But God uses men. God uses our hands. God uses our feet. And the point is, since he uses our hands and our feet, it means that the more hands and the more feet, it is what you call teamwork.
And I watched Sunday night as we had a swarm of people like locusts. And that's why I said I had to just jump and get this one together. Because I, I, I am excited. I saw when I looked behind me, saints were there. When I looked over to one side, saints were there. When I looked to the other, everywhere saints were. And at first, the people of the community did not come out. It was just saints. But when we go there as a swarm of locusts, things will happen. Teamwork makes the dream work. I want us to understand that that principle was demonstrated because all of a sudden at the end of the program, or at the, almost the end of the service, we start to look again and we see people coming out, ladies with their babies, men on the bicycle at the side, men over the corner, and whereas earlier on they were inside, the locust was just there, just buzzing and doing what they were doing until the harvest came out. And before you know it, two people got the Holy Ghost, 20 names were taken, who we are going to try to get home Bible study to, and the people said, come again. So the, the, this swarm, this teamwork, is not for the destruction of the community, but it is for the upliftment of the community. But the message, the lesson from the locusts is to work together as one, as a team, and make the thing happen. I am happy that Solomon told us to look to the ant. I am happy that Augur, writing in Proverbs 30, said, look at these four insignificant creatures and extract the lessons from them. Powerful lessons. And it is important. Look, the next slide tells us that no one locus is more important than the other. We are all in this thing together. And we are equal at the foot of the cross. No big locust, no, no, no small locust. No big Christian, no small Christian. We are just Christians in the work and ministry of the Lord. And we want to make this thing work. The Apostle Paul admonished us to work together as one. Just as the locusts work as one. You know, work together as one. And he, he used the scripture in um, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10. And listen, listen to how Paul described it. No, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul was saying, look here, get rid of the division. Look here, speak the same thing. If we're talking about Jesus, everybody say Jesus. If we're talking about souls, everybody say souls. Let nothing come in and divide, divide you. I, I can't say it often enough. But we need to be careful of those who sow seeds of division and pull them out so we can see them, so we can either work with them to fix them or so we can dispatch them out of the, the, this place. They are like cancers and must be cut out if they can't work. If radiation treatment can't make them come back together and bring the cells together, they must be cut out so that they do not infect the rest of the body but we must be very careful that we speak the same thing and that there be no divisions so that we can be perfectly joined together in the same mind once we don't speak the same thing so if we're talking about souls somebody over here talking about you talk about soul the bench tough and time now for them take some money and buy soft bench and, and bench with pads for us and we're not speaking the same thing after a while we get distracted and we start to talk about things and we look for things to criticize let me tell you something if you are looking for things to criticize you are going to find it there will always be a dirty curtain there will always be a dirty bench there will always be a paper somewhere floating around for you to criticize and say the place is not clean or the cleaners not doing their job but there's always going to be things if you're looking for it but let us speak the same language. Yeah, we, we have to try our best and we have to do what we have to do. Oh, and we have to find a way so that we see what the common goals and objectives are. Souls and 
into the community and work together as one and we're going to make it happen. The Bible says in the book of Acts, they had all things common. They were in one accord, in one place. Once we have that unity of mind and spirit, once we have that togetherness where there is no division, once we understand that uh, we have to work together as a team and the team is going to make it happen. It's not I, it's not Brother Daly, it's not Brother Bailey, it's not Brother Martin, it's not Brother Smith, it's not any one individual. If it's going to happen, we have to come together. This is the lesson from the locust. And it is important that we understand that concept, that critical attribute. The locust does nothing by himself. So even if we're doing some things individually and get some, that's fine. After a while, now we're going to put it together. And when we are going to attack it, when we are going to go into the community, I am very concerned when we say, let us go and canvas, nobody turn up. That's not the attribute of locusts that we are supposed to learn from. The attribute of the locusts is that we come together as a team and we make it happen. How can we call for canvassing for souls and 10 people turn up? How can we call for canvassing for souls and 20 people turn up? And we have hundreds of people in the church. Something is wrong. I want us to listen. We're not just taking the time to talk. We're teaching some things. And this must be applicable right across the board. If it's mission, if it's ministry work, let it be ministry work. What ministry are you in? If it's choir practice time, we are going to have to be there so that we can work together as a team. That when it is time to deliver, it is a teamwork. If it is hospital ministry, we are going to be together so that when it is time to go to the hospital, three people out of 20 don't go. When it is time for altar workers and four, five, six people are at the altar reaching out to God, two altar workers come out of a group of 25, something that we've got to learn the lesson from the locust, extract the attribute. The locust knows they never do anything by themselves. If they're going to go and take a city, swarm, we're going to swarm it. And then they make it happen. And they jump in, and then they come out together. And the job gets done. The principle, the lesson of the, lo of the locust, team work. They are team players and that is something extremely important and we must never ever forget that now as i close off on this and go to the last one i want us to understand something even though the locusts work together and teamwork and you say oh that's the perfect group the locusts themselves have their own weaknesses but they compensate for their weakness by working together. Yes, by pulling together. They understand. They know. They realize that some things, some weakness that they have. Did you know that locusts can't really fly? <laughs> fly like, lo locusts are not like birds, you know. What most folks don't know is that the locusts are really jumpers. A locust can jump 200 times its height. The biggest one that stand up, the biggest one, they can jump 200 times their height. Fly a little, but they can't fly. So what the locusts do, having recognized their weaknesses and, and that's as I said to us you know it is important because all of these little creatures that we have mentioned so far have weaknesses hmm? all of them have the ants has its weakness they can't operate in the winter the coney have its weakness its, its feet its hind leg which is supposed to be their leg of strength is so weak that they couldn't run from the slowest predator weak they know the weakness the locusts they know they can't fly or fly for long but they can only hop probably 200 times their height but 
they're aware of that weakness. And you know what they do to compensate? Normally when a certain wind, a strong east wind, or a wind coming out of the north or wherever, they know when the wind is coming and when it's going to be strong. And they start to jump and position themselves. And it reached the point that when that particular east wind or wind that blows across, you know, like at Christmas time in Jamaica, just as an example, there's a time when the breeze is strong and it's cool and yes, a boy, I feel the Christmas breeze. There are certain time, a certain season when a certain wind will blow and they are aware. They are aware of their weakness and they are aware, are aware when the winds will blow at certain times in certain place. And you know what they do? They jump and flap until they get caught up in the wind. And it is that wind that carry them from place to place. And so you're gonna see this big swarm of thing coming and they're being carried in the wind until they reach that particular location. And then they move into that place and devour that city. They use the wind. They're aware of their weakness, but they utilize what is available to them. I want us to know I want us to be aware that, beloved, the, the wind of the Holy Ghost is still moving. The wind of the Spirit of God. I feel the rain, somebody say. And, and, the, and the wind that blew at Pentecost, praise God, is still blowing today. And I want us to understand that even with our human limitations, because we are men, and by ourselves, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I want us to understand that the wind, that Holy Ghost wind still blows today and we must put ourselves in that space where the Holy Ghost will move us and carry us and take us to the places that we must be to devour the land like the locusts. Devour is a negative term because it speaks to tearing down. But I want to use a term different from devour for the saints of God. But we are going not to tear down, but we are going to build up. So when the Holy Ghost moves us, be available to move with the wind of the Holy Ghost. And when we decide to go, I want us to learn from the locusts and let us go as the Holy Ghost moves and the Spirit of God moves. Let's move with the Spirit, but let us move as a team. And if we have hundreds of people, it's not good to see 10 and 20 and 30 persons coming out for, for a group with hundreds of people. I want us to learn. I don't want the few to learn. I want make find a way to get the Bible study to people for them to understand that this is for everybody so whether it is street service whether it is hospital ministry whether it is host to host when a group must go when a ministry is in action move with the spirit understand that this is ministry work and so it is spirit work and we move with that and then allow for teamwork to prevail so that we can accomplish great things and we can have the effect and impact of the locusts together. Do what they must do. Get in and then get out. For us, together, do what we must do. Get in, get the souls and bring them out into the barn, the house of the living God. And from here now, we nurture them and disciple them and teach them and ready them for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so on, on this last slide on the locust, the, 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 the basic lesson, unity and power, teamwork and power by organization. They organize themselves and they come in bands, bands, well-organized, well-oiled machine, and they get the job done. Don't stand alone. We can't do it by ourselves. We need others to make things happen and for self-preservation. A very important concept. Learn it, live it, action it, and watch how both as individuals and as a body, the church of Jesus Christ, we achieve and accomplish great things. And then now, finally, lesson four, the lesson 
that the spider teaches us. And I made the point that there is no stopping the spider. They are persistent. They are always, no matter what we do, no matter how we try, we always find out that the spider somehow find a way to get into our house. You can lock your door, lock your window, go, out, go away for a four-week vacation, clean the house before you go, dust, sweep, cobweb out everything, and guarantee you when you come back, and you open the place and breezing out and you all bring visitors with you and say, this is my home and you, and you carry them on a plate. You see some spider way up there. So, and you say, oh my God, you're embarrassed. You come like you never clean your house. They find a way. And don't worry, it's not only you. It happened at King's house too. And chances are, if you check Buckingham Palace, Prince, uh, not Prince Charles, King Charles might be embarrassed wouldn't bring over the prime minister for a meeting in a place because down at the corner over there, so a cobweb where the people them, all the while they clean the place, they always tend to turn up. So the man that wrote, the wise man, knew exactly what he's talking about. When he said, even in the king's palace, they are found. There are no respect of places. They just turn up anywhere. King's palace, hotel, anywhere, they turn up. There are no respect of place or person. And that is something that we need to understand about the spider and that we can adopt. The Apostle Paul admonishes us to be per per persistent. I come into the scripture, but I just want to make the point. It's important, and I won't stay long because the time is almost upon me now. But look, as a child of God, it is important that we understand the principle of persistence and perseverance. It don't matter how much lick you take. It don't matter how much thing you go through. It don't matter how much times doors are closed in your face. The true child of God is going to continue to serve his God. Because like the three Hebrew boys, our God is able to deliver us. But... Even if he doesn't, we're still not going bow because we know who our God is and we know the God that we serve and he can deliver or he can leave us. Whichever way go, we're not going to stop serving him. I want us to have this kind of persistent attitude and attribute. I want to develop that in us as an attribute, persistence and persistence perseverance nothing must easily move you nobody must talk anything about you and you say boy i mean now go back to church because this brother this said that if that was the case so many people would have stopped coming if that was the case i would have gone oh gosh i hear so much thing pastor this pastor that you hear so much thing brother this brother that sister this sister that Duh. make up your mind to serve god and serve him to the best of your ability. Uh, something is said and you, you know it's, that is not how it goes. God is your defense. The Lord is your defender. You just serve him and be that persistent Christian. They, they tear down the web before you know it. A new one put up. They lick you down, they push you down. Guess what? You bounce right back. What a hard man for dead. What a hard woman for die. Because you are the persistent Christian. You are the spider Christian, if I might say that. Persistent. Tear down the webs around, you're going to come right up back. And after you come back, they, 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 they want you they relegate you to one little spot over here. So before you know it, you end up all in the king's palace. Your, your domain is everywhere as a child of God. At work, at school, at the home, at the hotel where you go for recreation. Anywhere you are, you can be a spider. You can just be there. The spider turns up anywhere. You, as a child of God, must maintain your Christianity at every place. If they call you to Buckingham Palace to give a speech, to give the vote of thanks for something, you're going there as a child of God. You're going there as a Christian. You're going there representing the Lord. In King's house, you can be a powerful witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you go down somewhere else and to, to, to what they call it, arms house, can you have a place where they call arms house? I never knew arms house was real. 
But this is one of those places where the folks who cannot take care of themselves and depend on the state to take care of them. Poor house, arms house, spider is there too. And if you are called upon as a child of God to give a word of encouragement, a word of advice, a word of exhortation at arms house, you should be there. So whether king's house, arms house, any house in between, you're a child of God, be a child of God and be ready to be there. And don't watch any face, don't watch any person, don't watch any place, don't watch any space. Be like the spider, pull your web anywhere and declare who you are and declare whose you are and present the word of God. The apostle Paul admonishes us to be persistent to persevere, look at the scripture that he uses, a powerful scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And that's a powerful scripture. In fact, the, the scripture is so powerful that I used um, the amplified version just to bring it a little closer home in terms of our English and our understanding. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord. In other words, always doing your best and doing more than is needed. Being continually aware that your labor, even to the point of exhaustion, in the Lord is not futile nor wasted. In other words, it is never without purpose. Brethren, this is deep. Brethren, this is, this is very deep. And I want us to understand that 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 look that um, spider is quiet. You don't hear no noise, like how you hear the locusts and you hear this swarm coming, and you know something is going to happen because the swarm of locusts coming here. It's not like the coli who makes his sounds as he does his thing. Well, the answer is also quiet, but here it is. The spider, you, you don't even see him. He's in the background. You don't even know where, as you can see the ants running up and down, and after a while, you see them making their movements. The spider, you don't even see him. You just, one day you pass, the place is quite clean and clear, and the next day, all of a sudden, you wonder, it's like them wait till night to spin the web, and then itch up in the corner, quietly, in the background, in the shadow. That's the child of God at work. We're not making any fuss. We're not making any fight. Just quiet persistence. Doing what we are doing. You don't have to be seen. You don't have to be heard. This is the attribute of the spider. Anywhere he goes, we must go anywhere. Any person, it don't matter if it's the king or the papa, is in their place. That's the spider. That's us with the word of God. That's us with a testimony for the Lord. And always persistent. You, they come with the broom and they cobweb the place and they tear it down. Give it a couple of days. You see the web back there again. How it gets there, we don't even know. But the final little crack and they come through. The final little crevice and they come through. And they find the corner and they spread the web. They weave the web and they're in their place. I quite contented doing what they know to do best. And this is a child of God. And so we close off this section by simply summarizing that particular point, lesson from the spider. Victory of perseverance and quiet persistence. That's in essence what comes, what we get from the spider. I want us to understand that. So trying again and again and again and again, being persistent and persevering. Don't give up. Be steadfast, immovable, always pushing on. Don't make anything stop you. That's the secret. That's the wisdom 
that we get from the spider. You see how these little creatures teach us big lessons? The thing about it, we might think we know these things, you know, but if you notice, the apostle and the the apostles in the New Testament speak of these things and we gloss over them. But when we go back to the Old Testament, there were no apostles there, but ants. Ants were there. And they teach us the same lesson. Conies were there. Locusts were there. Spiders were there. And the writer Augur puts them together and teach us the same lesson that we don't want to listen to when Paul and Peter and John and the others and James teach us them. So they, they, they've come about again and smack right in our faces for us to understand that this is Bible and the whole thing is one book authored by one author and it is Almighty God, Jesus, our great Lord himself. And those are the lessons that we can, from the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament, used to parallel the books of the epistles in the New Testament to teach us how to live to please God and to ensure that we are, we are on the path that will take us to no other place but the home of our souls. So, in conclusion, in an era where brilliant thinking and high technology is the order of the day, in an era where we are What's the word? But we love to see the academics come forward to present solutions because we are into big thinking. We are into academia and brilliance. And we believe the solutions will come from men. They will not. The Bible directs us as children of God to basic virtues, to basic things. God used the simple things to teach us the real big lessons, the lessons that really are for us. The Bible literally uses small things, and we said it in the scriptures that we had read at the very start in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27. He has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are the Bible gives us some basic virtues. With the ants, to be industrious and hardworking. And it is very important that we appreciate that. With the coney, to know how we build so that we can properly hide ourselves in the rock. And it's very important. With the, with, the, with the low costs, he shows us the spirit of teamwork to make things happen. And with the spider, the wisdom of persistence and perseverance so that we can achieve our ultimate goal. Brothers and sisters, as simple and as small as these creatures are, the lessons are large and powerful and profound. I encourage all of us to look at the simple thought, the simple Bible study, simple subject matter, sub subject area, little things with big lessons. I want us to pull the big lessons. I want us to apply them, to action them, to live them. And I absolutely guarantee you that you will see the impact in your walk with Almighty God. God bless you. God's willing next week. Well, not next week, because next week, this time we will be in the final night of Ignite or Youth Convocation. But God richly bless you. And 
by the following Wednesday, God's willing, we're looking forward to continue in Bible study. Just to let you know that our magazines are here, our 10th anniversary magazine, 10th anniversary as Faith Apostolic Ministries, they are here. The cost is $1,750, and it's for all our churches. We have in those magazines the information for Faith Chapel, Faith Deliverance, Faith Majestic. Yes, information for Faith Chapel Kelowna, and um, information from the churches in Africa. So it's a must-have, and we want all of us to purchase our copy, $1,750. For the saints that are overseas, I want you to know that we have your copies here, and we will make arrangements to get them to you. Just send to us. Um, you know how to reach us online, and I believe there is the, <laughs> the, the, the phone number that you can reach out to us on. If not, you just call the office and you know the office numbers, 876-905-0484, 876-931-0081. And of course, the, the cell number, the WhatsApp number, reach out to them or just write us online if you're watching us in service. Um, you know, there is a chat group, just in your chat, just say, look here, such, such, and such, we need it here, here, here. We'll know where you are. We will do the necessary, make the necessary arrangements and work out the logistics and get them to you. For those in the US, I, I would say it is $15 for your copy. If you're in Canada, just about $20. If you're in Europe, I would say about 10, 12 euros and it's, it's your copy. We just want to recover back the costs, and, uh, but we really want you to have a copy as a keepsake. And all our brethren locally, please get your copies. They will be out on Sunday. Uh, we will have a desk at the front, probably downstairs, so that after church you can pick up your copy as you go home. But you must have it. Amen? And it's very, very important that every saint purchase a copy. And we will have enough, amen, to send abroad. We can print more, but we will have enough to send abroad to all our brethren that will require a copy. So God bless you. Support it in the name of the Lord. Let us pray as we dismiss. We bless your great name, mighty God. And we thank you for another opportunity to share with all of us in Bible study. I pray that the things that we discuss tonight, the things that we study tonight, mighty God, we will apply them, we will action them so that our lives will be uplifted, so that we will move from one grade to another and advance in the kingdom of Almighty God. Have your own way, great God. Let your name be glorified, let your will be done. We give you thanks, we give you glory. We bless your great name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So God bless you. Thanks again for being with us in another Bible study. And God's willing, not next week, but the week after, join us in Youth Convocation. Ignite begins this Sunday morning. And what a time we are anticipating. Join us and let's have a great time in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>